Hello everyone. This topic is very close to my heart. I'm just waiting for them to show an image. Great. Okay. When you see this image, what talks to your mind? Anyone? What about? Movie? That is correct. This is the logo of that movie, but this number holds a special value too. According to economic survey, these are the number of startups who have become unicorn in the last decade in India. Now, unicorn is a startup which has grown more than one billion dollar valuation. Of the 83 startups, 44 of them were born just the last year, which is a great start. But is that good enough? for a country of our size and youth population like ours. Let's dissect. In India, 1.4 crore students graduate every year. And of them, 83% want to start something of their own, while the world averages 53%. So even data suggests Indians are very entrepreneurial in nature. So in last decade, if we do the maths, we should have seen 11 crore entrepreneurs, which is 1.4 crore multiplied by 10 years, multiplied by 83%. Now, guess how many startups were born in last decade? It was 61,000. Only. Of the 11 crore entrepreneurs, only 61,000 startups were born. Respectively, almost about 1 lakh entrepreneurs must have taken the plunge. Now, what stopped these entrepreneurs to give up their dreams and go for a job? To probe this question, I am Ahmedabad conducted a research which found out that the biggest disabler for people like you to start their own organization is the lack of funding for their venture. Now, there are so many great companies who have, who have become big organizations without the funding need. Imagine if only a tiny percentage of those 11 crore entrepreneurs realized that funding is not a necessity. How many more unicorns or how many more startups could have been born in India? The companies like Zerodha, Zoho, Wingify, Latent View, Fusion Charge, Quack Quack, and many more, and of course, eSmarter, are all the companies who have not taken even a dime from an investor or a bank. They all have had very humble beginning and have become humongous organizations along the way. Now, let me tell you a little bit about eSmarter before I tell you how did we become a unicorn without raising any money. We started Eastwater in year 2008 with a very meager investment of 15 lakh rupees of our own. And right now, Eastwater is second largest travel portal in India. Last year, we even got listed on NSC and BSC. That was a successful listing. <laughs> now, the two unique things about our journey is that we have been bootstrapped. Bootstrapped is a word which means that you have not taken money from anyone. We have bootstrapped even till now. And also we have been profitable in an industry where most of our competitors are losing money, bleeding money and taking more money from investors. And I am over here to share a few of the learnings which we have also inculcated in the last 13 years of our journey. So the first one is, you won't be able to understand all this. 
Find your why and surrogate your way in. Find your why and surrogate your way in. See, even before we started eSmarter, we started a very small mom and pop travel agency with the name of Duke Travel Agency. We ran that travel agency for about a year. And then we realized the pain points a travel agent goes through. And using technology, we can solve them. So the first version of eSmarter was just solving pain point of a travel agent, not the regular consumer company which we have become now. For one year, we worked with them. So for one year, we ran Duke Travel Agency and then we started eSmarter. For the next three years, we only served travel agents. So this was our why. Since we were a travel agent ourselves, we had a very strong why of what we were doing at eSmarter. Now, for the next three years, we ran eSmarter without promoting it to consumers. It was purely used by travel agents. Now, in those three years, we created the technology, the operations, the relationship with the airlines and the hotels, which we could not have done if we were a consumer company in the beginning. We, we could not have bought the big giants, which were already there at that time. So this was a surrogate way by which we entered. And in year 2011, we started promoting eSmarter to regular consumers and right now 94% of our business is regular consumer business. So this is how we surrogate ourselves inside. And it's not that we did not try to raise VC money. We met a couple of investors and later on we realized that we are much better off meeting travel agents rather than creating polished pitch decks. Which brings me to my next point. It's okay to not to raise money in the beginning. See, VC money, venture capital money, PE money, bank loan, they all are good money, but they are there to solve your teething problems. They are not a necessity to your success. In the beginning, when we met VCs and we told them our plan, that we will start with a B2B company and then we will become a B2C company. Of course, we did not, we could not raise money. But later on, whatever our thoughts, our action plans were, it started to be fine. Now, later on, when we shifted ourselves to a consumer company, I bet if we had any VC on board at that time, we would not be able to pivot. Pivot is basically changing your business model. A VC's perspective is only for two to three years in horizon, while an entrepreneur thinks for a decade. We knew we have to shift from travel agent model to consumer model because it was written on the wall. We could see that decade later everybody would be using an app or a website rather than going to travel agent. Now, had we had a VC at that time, I don't think so we would be able to pay it. So, in a way, by not having a VC money, it did a great favor to our organization. That brings me to my third point. See, the third point I want to share over here is that be disciplined in whatever you're doing. And then you will start seeing compounding effects over a long period of time. Let me explain. See, we believe businesses are done only for two reasons. Reason number one, to serve your consumers very really well. And reason number two, to do it profitably so that you can serve them for a longer duration of time. Whenever there is abundance of VC money, most of the entrepreneurs, they focus on growth, not as much as efficiency. So, and every industry goes through a cycle where there is a lot of money in the beginning and then consolidation happens, the money starts drying up. So when the money starts drying up, it becomes extremely challenging for entrepreneurs to change the culture of the company a decade later. And that is why you see a lot of well-funded startups shut their shop in the later part of their world, in the later part of their cycle. So at least my trip, we knew that what our unit economics is very well. At a gross level, we would earn anywhere between 8 to 10 percent and of which 5% directly goes in giving discounts, marketing or payment gateway charges. Only 3% is remaining 
for our employee expenses. Now, how did we manage that? So there is one hack which we have used over the period of time which I'd like to share. At least my trip, we usually hire talented freshers like you for our call center and operations department. And whenever somebody is showing signs of overachiever, we put them through a very rigorous training model and we graduate them to become product managers, VPs of the company, quality assurance guys of the companies, and also even the designers. Now this way, the entire team is extremely excited about running the organization because they can see that there is a way path forward and we are able to manage our cost. Another thing which we have done instead of using traditional marketing as a methodology which is print, TV advertisements, we over a period of last decade we must have done more than 100 barter deals with other brands which are not competing in nature. So if there is another company which is of equal size of each market, we promote their group and they promote our group. These are the barter deals on the basis of which the company grew and grew on the marketing spends. Now, let me share about the fourth point. We know the pandemic must have been the toughest for companies like us, for the tourism sector. Now, this is where I think we have taken the biggest plunge. And I'm proud to say that the tough times actually make tougher companies. During the pandemic times, we have done a couple of things extremely different, which has made us become a household name as what we are right now. For example, as soon as pandemic started, the requirement of everybody was to get the refund for the flight which they booked. Now, companies like us are at mercy of airlines and hotels to give back the money so that we can refer to the consumer. At ease my trip, realizing the need of the hour, we depleted our cash reserves by 130 crores and we gave refund instantly to people, which created humongous amount of uproar on social media where everybody was saying that ease my trip is the only one refunding money to consumers. As soon as lockdown opened up, we immediately jumped from third largest position to second largest position. And it did not cost us much because two months later, the airlines and hotels paid us back. But it was a gutsy decision at that time because God forbid if any airline or hotel had gone bankrupt, we would have lost money. The second thing which we did very differently during this, it was actually just after the second lockdown. Second lockdown. In the month of June, when the second lockdown was getting over, we realized that people want to travel but there is an hesitation. What if I call sick? What if I get quarantined? Now wherever there is a challenge, there is an opportunity. And ease my trip, we came up with a free path baking service which is live even right now. Services that book flight tickets on ease my trip and if you happen to cancel it later due to any medical reasons, just approve doctor's prescription and you will get your entire money back. Including the money which is deducted by the airlines it will be pocketed by us. Now at the time of starting this service, our half of our team was very shaken because we all know how easy is it to get the medical prescription, right? And almost 12 to 15 percent flights get cancelled. Now, I'm happy to share that less than 1 percent people upload their doctor's prescription, which I believe must be an accurate number. And the learning which we have had is that if you put trust in people, they put trust back in you. These were some of the small but significant learnings I wanted to share today with you all for what we have done in the last 30 years. I hope I am able to inspire a very few of you to grow this count exponentially even further. Thank you everyone.